Hey, it's Mike here, and today we're going to be looking at a small armada of new vegan research, which I guess it's technically more like a flotilla, which I feel like should be pronounced flotilla, like tortilla. Already going on tangents. The point is, in a relatively short amount of time, we're gonna cover a bunch of interesting research. We have various randomized control trials. We have a new study comparing the muscle protein synthesis of vegan protein versus meat. We have a study on blood types and plant-based diets. We have a new study on intramyocellular lipids by Neil Bernard. We have a study on fecal transplants by vegans, a couple on plant milks. We're gonna go through it all quickly. So you guys seem to like the last research blast and there are just so many studies out there that don't need their own video, but you should know about, they're interesting, so let's go. To start off, let's just go straight there. Let's just go to the poop stuff, the fecal transplant study. Uh, vegans have been known to create what can be referred to as brown gold, and I'm not talking about glacial soils talking about what has previously been referred to as night soil, actually. For those that don't know, a fecal transplant is when you take some fecal matter from a healthier host that has a healthier gut microbiome profile, and then you put it into the intestine of somebody who has some health issue. And that way you can get all of those good bacteria past the acid in your stomach, for example, and put it right where it needs to be. There have been some good results in the past, but this particular study looked at what is called steatohepatitis, which is under the umbrella of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it is a inflammatory liver disease. The researchers say, quote, the intestinal microbiota has been linked to the development and prevalence of steatohepatitis in humans. Interestingly, steatohepatitis is significantly lower in individuals taking a plant-based low animal protein diet, which is thought to be mediated by gut microbiota. So they took the samples from what they described as lean vegan donors, gave it to the people with the liver disease, and the results were, yes, it appears that it changed the intestinal microbiota composition and had other beneficial effects, which in particular, included a trend toward less liver cell death that was caused by inflammation, as well as changes in liver gene expression around lipid metabolism and inflammation, so pretty good. This is all contributing to my dystopian future fear of people starting to farm vegans for their cancer-fighting blood and clearly disease-fighting poop. We can't let the wrong people find out about this. <laughs> I will not be enslaved <laughs> for my poop. But really, it's amazing that we see these effects, but it's obvious that these people would be better off if they just maybe change their diet to naturally get those benefits and continue to get those benefits and probably other benefits. All right, time to dump that subject. Next is muscle protein synthesis. This is a study that compared fungi or mushroom protein to meat. It's a randomized control trial from Exeter Legit University. And they had, of course, that vegan group and that meat-based group. And you can look at this chart here, pause it if you want. You can see when they took what samples, but they did take muscle samples at the beginning and the end of that vegan period. They also had them do leg extensions and they took muscle samples from the muscles in the leg that were worked out and other muscles that weren't worked out to compare muscle synthesis. They, of course, matched the groups for protein and calories, and the results were daily muscle protein synthesis rates did not differ between omnivore and vegan groups in either rested or exercised muscles. And the vegan group actually had better muscle protein synthesis, but it was not statistically significantly different, or as I call it, stat sig diff, bruh. Not SSD, but there is one interesting thing here in that it was funded by Marlowe Foods, which... <gasps> owns Quorn, the company that makes those mycoprotein or mushroom protein products. We're talking mock meats, etc. So you might be thinking, oh my gosh, this company is totally biased. Well, Quorn isn't even a fully vegan company. Most of their products have eggs and their vegan products make up a minority of their product but they still tested a vegan diet, so who really knows their motivations? So this once again shows that anti-vegan bro science about muscle protein synthesis is not merited. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to Neil Bernard, who's been busy. He has two studies that we're gonna talk about here, and his team, of course, they deserve credit. They're both technically the same randomized control trial, they just have different analyses, and the first one is the one on intramyocellular lipids and other markers, and it was a 16-week randomized control trial. Once again, intramyocellular lipids just 
obese means fat within the muscle cell, and there are many studies demonstrating that this can lead to insulin resistance through a complicated mechanism that I've talked about a lot. We don't need to get into in this video. Of course, insulin resistance is the root of type two diabetes and the results of the study were that the low fat plant-based dietary intervention reduced body weight, of course, energy intake and increased postprandial metabolism. They found a lowering in both liver lipids and those muscle lipids, the intramyocellular ones, and increased insulin sensitivity, the opposite of insulin resistance. So of interest, they also lost 12 pounds and they also increased what is called the thermic effect of food. In other words, the food that they ate made them way hotter, way sexier. That was really what the study was about. I'm kidding, that's not what it means. It doesn't mean it's not true of the participants, but it's not what it means uh, from this study, uh, the thermic effect of food is, quote, the increase in the metabolic rate that occurs after a meal. Evidence suggests that the thermic effect of food is increased by larger meal sizes as opposed to frequent small meals, intake of carbohydrate and protein, as opposed to dietary fat and low-fat plant-based diets. There you go. This concept is actually pretty complicated, involves uh, different effects of different foods. So I could do a video on that if you want me to. Let me know. Anyway, moving on. This next study is on blood types in a plant-based diet, and it is actually the same study, original people, the same trial, but then again, analyzing it differently for the effect of different blood types, maybe one blood type, like that O blood type, according to uh, Dr. Diadamo or whatever, saying that blood types determine uh, what you should be eating, that they would be really great with meat, and when they stop eating meat, they'll do worse, so was that true? In accordance with the conclusions I made in my previous blood type diet video, and all of the large scale research on blood types and diet. Blood type is not associated with changes in cardiometabolic outcomes in response to a plant-based dietary intervention. And so people who come at this with like, oh, I can't be plant-based or vegan because my blood type is, oh, uh, people are still clearly getting the benefits here and the benefits include improvements in body weight, body fat, plasma lipid concentrations, and glycemic control. So no, there weren't any lion people in this study that just couldn't handle those plant foods. Go home. So one of the criticisms of my last research blast video, probably by somebody who wasn't vegan, was like, oh, I don't include all the negative anti-vegan studies. Well, I did a whole video on that Epic Oxford bone study. And so why not throw one in here that's at least cautioning vegans or putting it in a slightly more negative light. And that is this study on zinc and strokes. So they don't actually look at stroke rates. They just go off that Epic Oxford data as well on strokes. I have a whole video about that. And they're saying that maybe zinc could be playing a role in hemorrhagic strokes. So eating more zinc could be protective. We don't really know. It's just throwing the idea out there. So I thought I'd throw that one in there as well. Now you little nitpickers can't deny all of the other research in this video just because I didn't include a negative study. Boom. Now into the world of plant milks. And I usually don't talk about studies I don't have access to. Thankfully, I'm able to get access to pretty much every study that I want. But this one was from the uh, Journal of Dairy Science. So they just, as a rule, didn't let me access anything because they know how vegan I am. That's not that big of a deal. The only thing I wanted to know was how they got their sample here looking at plant milks and households. Because they say that now 23% of the households that they looked at are eating virtually exclusively plant-based milks. So if this proportionally represents the US as a whole, that is absolutely huge. And I, I think it makes sense because again, they talk about having some flexitarians here, the flexitarian group, about 15% of households that consumed less dairy milk, less cow's milk. And so adding all that together, dairy's getting hit pretty hard. And that brings me to this next study, this paper really that I consider just a little bit pretentious. It has some good stuff in it but a little bit pretentious from Oxford. It, it gets a little philosophical. I mean, let me just read this excerpt. This work in turn builds on a long history of research and cultural studies that takes marketing as the poetry of capitalism, Bath 1972, Williamson 1978, and seeks to lay bare the prejudices that lie behind the smooth surfaces of the visible. Yes, that is from a paper on the marketing tactics of the plant-based milk industry. Anyway, a lot of it just has some good neutral facts and it has something I find kind of annoying at the end, but they do mention here, quote, dairy is experiencing a pronounced economic crisis as a result of overproduction and decreasing consumer demand. And it's really long, so maybe I'm nitpicking here a little bit, but they say something that is very nutty milk without the milk, and that is 
that one possible outcome of plant-based milk consumption is the encouragement of industrial dairy systems that are environmentally harmful and of limited benefit to rural livelihoods. Continued consolidation into mega farms has been driven in the past by price competition that privileges economies of scale. They're saying that as people drink less cow's milk, eat more plant-based dairy products that somehow <laughs> the dairy industry will conglomerate even more into mega industrial farms. Isn't that what happens as people drink more cow's milk too? So, but, but it's the vegans fault. No, it's people drinking plant-based milk. I feel like this is a weird scare tactic, you know, for people who do care about small businesses and the environment to just be like scared out of drinking plant-based milk. I don't know, maybe it was just a thought they had. But then you realize that this paper was also supported by that Wellcome Trust, Wellcome Trust, still don't know how to pronounce it, that has that LEAP grant, that uh, Livestock Environment and People grant that, as I mentioned in my previous video, two out of two of the Oxford studies, you know, the one on bones and the one on strokes were disproportionately making vegans look bad compared to the rest of all of the literature that is released. So that raised a little bit of a red flag. And I said, if the third study in a row makes vegans look bad, then there's something going on here. This one is like strike two and a half. It isn't an actual nutrition study, but it has these undertones of like, like it doesn't seem supportive of plant-based milks, which as we know, if this is actually a sustainability angle that they're taking here, are so much better for the environment that it's ridiculous. Anyway, you can read it. It's really long. Read it. Make a judgment for yourself. All right, now for the last study, which isn't anything crazy, but it's a little bit interesting, and that is a study looked at dried blood samples comparing a higher-fat meat-based diet to a higher-carb vegan diet, and it was actually crossover design, so they had the same people switch diets. They looked at the dried blood samples, used chromatography to distinguish what was in them, and the main difference that I see is that the higher fat group had more triglycerides. They had fattier blood, and this was taken three hours after eating. So maybe a little representation of that sludge blood that I always talk about. And when the people were on the vegan diet, they had a higher sorbitol content of their diet, which is just a fruit sugar, which is no surprise. But the interesting thing here is that you can take literally a dry drop of blood and get a reasonable idea of what somebody is eating. Anyway, that covers all of the studies for today. So once again, let me know if you do like this type of video. I will definitely make more in the future if you do, maybe every five or six videos, because there's so much of this vegan research that comes out that just doesn't need a whole video. I could be doing individual videos on all of these, but people would probably be less interested and they'd probably start watching my channel less and then my channel would slowly nosedive if I did individual videos. Ugh, Mike posted a whole video about poop transplants? Ugh, unsubscribe. But if you haven't already, you maybe just forgot to subscribe <laughs> after all these years, you can, you can click the subscribe button. It's okay, it'll be all right. And <laughs> like the video helps. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.